Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Which GeForce GTX 1060 graphics card should you buy? Updated 2017 edition. This video is going to be a comparison between different manufacturers and different models of GTX 1060 cards. I've previously done a very similar video to this, but that was in the summer of 2016. We are now in 2017, so this is an updated look two added graphics cards, live game test video that I'll be putting up here later in the video, and a bonus and surprise for you later in this video, so stay tuned to check that out. Now the purpose of this video is, where does the 1060 fit into the graphics card lineup in 2017? Which one should you buy? And what are the differences between all these cards? I see it all over the web. I see it in my own YouTube comments. I see it on other message boards and forums. People are confused because they see one fan cards, two fan cards, three fan cards, factory overclock and standard cards. They find ones with and without a backplate. Is there really any benefit to buying a more expensive or a different graphics card as opposed to something simple and basic? That's what we're going to answer today, as well as provide a look at what I see the future of the 1060 card being throughout the rest of this year. First, let me talk about the 1060 in general. It is, in my opinion, about the perfect 1080p gaming graphics card. Now, in 2017, I will say that the 1060 plays all current games at an average of high detail at 60 frames a second at 1080p. I once said that it played games at ultra detail. Well, that's starting to come down because new, more advanced games are coming out, or some people would say less optimized console ports, but that's a separate topic. But as new games come out, detail settings have to be turned down in order to maintain a 60 frame rate gameplay on the same hardware. Now, as we move to the end of 2017 and into early 2018, that will have to come down again. I expect that when we do this video again in 2018 with whatever the new cards are, the 1060 will be the perfect medium detail graphics card for 1080p. Now, if you want to extend your ability to play at high details, you need to buy up a card instead of a 1060, buy a 1070, and you'll get an extra year or two out of higher detail gameplay while maintaining your frame rate, but you'll spend more money to do it, so that's a personal choice. The other card that you could consider for this level of performance is AMD's RX 480, an excellent graphics card that I've covered in other videos. I won't cover it here, but if you prefer AMD rather than NVIDIA, the competition to the 1060 is the RX 480. Now, I mentioned that this is the perfect 1080p graphics card, or at least it is in my opinion. It will also play many games at 1440p, not all, and not at high detail, but it will play many games very, very well. So if you're on a budget and you wanna play at higher resolutions and you're willing to either compromise the detail settings or maybe not play every brand new game that comes out, it's a modest, reasonable choice for 1440p gaming. I think the 1070 is a better choice for 1440p, but that's a more expensive card, I understand. All five of these cards were installed in the same computer. Linked in the video description below, you will find a link to my $1,500 i7 7700K build video series. Parts overview, the build itself, system setup, Windows performance, storage performance, game performance, it's all down there in that video playlist. So if you'd like to see the computer that these were installed in, go check out that video series. We have the Zotac Amp Edition, the EVGA Superclocked, the EVGA for the win, the Gigabyte G1 Gaming, and the ASUS Republic of Gamers Strix. Very fancy RGB triple fan graphics card. There are a number of differences between these cards, but what is not different is the noise profile. The computer these were installed in was placed on the desk, not under it, two feet away from me while I was playing the games and running the test that you'll see in the video. None of these fans are audible. None of these cards make any appreciable noise. They are all, I won't call them silent, they are really close to silent. There is no difference worth talking about in terms of fan noise. So, putting noise aside, because these are all basically silent, let's talk about other features. The Zotac Amp and the EVGA Superclocked both use a six pin PCI Express power connector. That is very nice because it makes them easy to install in more computers. Do you have a pre-built or a mini tower case? Maybe an older power supply that only has six pin PCI Express power connectors? These should be your go-to cards. 
easier to install. In fact, this SuperClock card has spent the past six months installed in a pre-built mini tower computer because of that six pin PCI Express power connector. The For The Win, the G1 Gaming, and the ASUS Republic of Gamers Strix card all have eight pin PCI Express power connectors. So if you go that route, make sure that your power supply has an eight pin connector. Backplates. The G1 Gaming and the ASUS Republic of Gamers each have a backplate, and I'll show that here. The For The Win, Superclocked, and Zotac do not. This is an aesthetic difference, not a performance or temperature difference. The backplates do not act as cooling, they just act as appearance options simply to look nice. I suppose you could say they protect the card from dust or mishandling. It lets you set the card down on a desk without either damaging the desk or damaging the card. but it's just an appearance thing. If you like the back plate, if you think it looks nice, well, go that route. Otherwise, it doesn't make any difference. Lighting effects. The For The Win card has white LED lights printed on the top. The Superclocked and the Zotac do not. Both the Gigabyte G1 Gaming and the ASUS Republic of Gamers have a full RGB lighting system. You can use their software to change the colors of the RGB lights on the cards. If that's something that's important to you, then definitely go that route. If you simply want some white light in your system, then you can go with the For The Win. It can be turned off in their Precision OC software if you want. And if you don't care at all, well then you have these two cards and you don't have to worry about it. The ports on the back of these video cards are different on one of these cards. The ASUS ROG Strix card has two HDMI 2 ports and two DisplayPort 1.4s. The other four cards have one HDMI 2.0 port and three DisplayPort 1.4s. Why did they go the route of putting the two HDMI ports on there? Virtual reality. Do you have an Oculus Rift or an HTC Vive? Those require an HDMI port not a display port. Now there's adapters. You can absolutely get an inexpensive adapter to convert one of those to an HDMI port. But the reason they went that route was to make it very easy to plug in a standard monitor of basically any type all the way up to 4K and then plug your uh, VR headset into the other port without needing to use an adapter. Otherwise, they all support the same level of monitors, 4K at up to 120 hertz on the display port 1.4s and 4K at up to 60 hertz on the uh, HDMI 2.0 port. Now, they each do have a DVI-D port which supports up to 1600p, more likely 1440p. Now, I mentioned earlier in the video that these are primarily 1080p graphics cards, so why would you hook up a 4K monitor? These will drive a 4K monitor for productivity apps just fine. If you set your games to 1080p, and you're plugged into either a 4K television or a 4K monitor, it scales perfectly. It's exactly double the width and double the height, so the pixels all double. There's no jaggies, there's no fuzzies. 1080p displayed on a 4K monitor will basically look the same as 1080p displayed on a 1080p monitor because it scales perfectly. So if you want to get a 4K monitor now, but game at 1080p until you can upgrade in the future to a better graphics card, these will do the trick just fine. That just leaves us with price and performance. When it comes to price, prices vary. Links in the video description below to both Amazon and Newegg for all of these cards. I suggest you compare current prices when you watch this video and pick out the card that works best for you. However, when I filmed this video, the cards ranged from $250 for the Superclocked card all the way up to $300 for the ASUS ROG Strix card. Each of the others is somewhere in between there. Now, do you get more performance for spending more money? Well, let me show you a full screen graph showing you all five cards in Rise of the Tomb Raider in the game's built-in benchmark DirectX 12, and you can decide for yourself. And here is the performance chart. You are looking at all five cards with the average frame rate across all of the tests in the built-in benchmark to Rise of the Tomb Raider. If it looks like all the cards are about the same performance, you would be correct, they pretty much are. Interestingly enough, the Superclocked card is the fastest of all five cards, running at just about 50 frames per second. That's impressive. It has a single fan, it is the least expensive card, and yet somehow it's the fastest out of the bunch. Now, these cards are all auto overclocking themselves, and this is a very important point. None of these cards are running at the out of the box clock speed but I did not manually overclock any of them. 
these cards benefit from GPU boost, which is a feature from NVIDIA that temperature and power delivery limits allowing, these cards will run themselves even faster than the factory overclock settings. Simple example, the SuperClock card comes with a base core clock speed just over 1600 megahertz and a boost speed of just over 1800 megahertz. But if you were watching the MSI afterburner numbers in the video earlier, it was running at two gigahertz. So it is auto overclocking itself about 150-ish megahertz over the factory overclock. All of the cards are doing that, but they're each doing it to a different extent. As I said before, each of these were installed in the same computer. Each of these were run in the out-of-the-box state, allowing GPU boost to auto overclock them. While it's true that the SuperClock card in the out-of-the-box configuration was actually the fastest card here, it is worth noting that if you wish to manually overclock your card further, it may not remain so. It has the most basic power delivery system, a 6-pin PCI Express power connector, and a single fan. To give you a comparison, the SuperClock card has a 3 plus 1 phase power delivery system, a very simple power delivery. It works fine, runs at 2 GHz just fine. But the For the Win card has a 6 plus 1. It also has an 8-pin PCI Express power connector and two fans. It has a larger custom printed circuit board and a larger cooler. So in theory, if you get into either Precision OC, EVGA's program, or MSI Afterburner, which also works just fine, you could overclock the For the Win card further than the SuperClocked. Please note, how far you can overclock any given card manually is going to depend upon your specific card. Each card is different. The connection of the cooler to the card itself to the chip, how much thermal compound is on there, how good your particular manufactured chip happens to be. I could buy five different For the Win cards, play around with manual overclocking, and I would get five different results because they're all different. So if you do want to manually overclock, yes, the For the Win, the Gigabyte G1 Gaming, and the uh, Seuss Republic of Gamer Strix card do have benefits over these two cards more power available, better power delivery systems, more cooling. If, however, you plan to just buy the card, put it in your machine, turn it on, and use it, buy the SuperClock from EVGA. Not only is it the least expensive, but at least in my test, in the out-of-the-box configuration, it was also the fastest. It also has the benefit of being the smallest and the easiest to install in most computers. So that is my recommendation for most people unless you plan to manually overclock. In that case, some of these might make sense. I mentioned earlier in the video that I had a bonus for you. I do. It's right here. This is the MSI Gaming X GTX 1060. This is the 3 gigabyte version, which is why it was not included in the test that would not remotely be fair to the other cards. The performance difference is different between the 6 and the 3 gigabyte cards because the actual processing core count, the CUDA core count, is different. But I have it on the desk because I want to show you it's cooler, its size, and talk about it. Otherwise, people are going to say, where's the MSI card? I've now removed the smaller cards and put the ASUS Republic of Gamers and the EVGA for the win on either side of the MSI card so you can see the relative size difference between the cards. This is the tallest card, although not the longest card. It is also a very heavy card. It does have a backplate. It's very nice. It has an 8-pin PCI Express power connector just like these two. Excellent cooling, excellent power delivery system. If you want to manually overclock your card, it's a great choice, either in the 3 or the 6 gigabyte version. That being said, don't expect it to be any faster than the others. Just expect it to have more overclocking potential if you do it manually, but in the out-of-the-box configuration, it's going to be about the same speed as all the other cards. Now, I mentioned it's a 3 gigabyte card. I have another 3 gigabyte card, a SuperClock 3 gigabyte. Running this card against that, same thing, same out-of-the-box performance. It's only when you manually overclock do you notice any difference. So I just wanted to show that to you to so you could see what it looked like and make you aware of it. I actually quite like MSI cards. If you like the red, great. If you don't, that's fine too. But it's an option to consider if you want a high-end card with excellent overclocking potential. So which GeForce GTX 1060 should you buy? 
Well, that depends, but most of you, in my opinion, should buy this one, the Superclocked. It is the smallest, easiest to install card in most computers. It is the most compatible with a six pin PCI Express power connector. It auto overclocks very well. It's a very fast performer and it's the least expensive card here. The only exceptions would be, do you want RGB lighting? If you care about such things, then the ASUS Republic of Gamers Strix card would be my first choice with the Gigabyte G1 Gaming, a very close runner up. If you want to manually overclock, if that sort of thing is of interest to you, then either the For the Win card from EVGA or the Gigabyte or the ASUS card would also be a consideration along with the MSI card, which also has an excellent power delivery system. If you want to see just how far you can push your card, if you want to turn the memory and the clock speed of the chip itself up as far as you can get them, then I would skip the super clocked card and I would go with the faster cards. However, most people, in my opinion, don't do that. I think most people are better off served with the $250 EVGA Superclocked. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with a big huge red button directly below this video. Questions and comments in the comment section. And as always, check out the video description, links to Amazon and Newegg for everything mentioned here. Links to my full playlist on my $1,500 computer build video series will be down there and links to my original 1060 overview in the summer of 2016 and links to my individual unboxing and review on some of these cards will also be down there. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.